Hey, fans of Subject Bound, Who Killed Julie, Diary of a Madman, or Horrible Writing, this is Paul Sadin, the creator of those shows. My new horror anthology, my second book, is coming out soon. This special episode features one of the stories from that book. It's called The Snowman, written by me, narrated by the wonderful Heather Auden, which who you have heard on all the seasons of Subject Found, in the first season of Diary of a Madman, and in the last two seasons of Atheist Apocalypse. She does a wonderful job narrating this, as always. If you're interested in hearing more about 12 Deaths of Christmas, if you want to know when it comes out at a special pre-order price, go over to either paulsading.com and sign up for my newsletter. You will find a small window on that front page or any of the pages to sign up. And I have a no spam guarantee. I only release periodic newsletters because I know we all have enough email as it is. Or if that doesn't work, you could become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, or join me on my author page on Facebook. Just go over to Facebook in your search feature, type in author Paul Sading. It will take you to that group. You have to get permission to join and then you can come hang out with me all the time. Any of those three options is a wonderful way not only to stay in touch with me, but also find out any of the new stuff that is coming out and when you can get special deals on those. I hope you enjoy the sneak peek into what you can expect from the entire book of 12 Deaths of Christmas. And again, head over to paulsading.com, sign up for the newsletter, or join me on patreon.com forward slash paulsading or at author paulsading on Facebook. You have to search for that and you'll be kept into the loop when you can actually pre-order the book. A content warning for some of you, the snowman does have very adult language and themes to include themes about mental and physical and emotional abuse. Enjoy, and I hope to see you over on the Facebook page, in the newsletter, or over on Patreon. Thank you for your support of all my podcasts. The Snowman I'm the motherfucking snowman. She couldn't hear him. The world was a painful haze of booze and cocaine. Her head felt thick, like someone filled it with concrete, hard to hold up. In the haze, Eddie was talking. She was sure of that. The world was pain. Her body was the canvas upon which it was conceived, outlined, filled in where dimension was added until it was finally realized. She had the snowman to thank for that. Fuck, man. I can't get comfortable. The snowman, did he even remember his name anymore? Squirmed on the rotted sofa, spreading his naked legs and grabbing his hairy balls in a grip that looked tight. That had to hurt, didn't it? Shit. Even if it did. Eddie, the snowman would simply enjoy it that much more. The snowman was masochistic. That's because you're still flying, she moaned, her skull vibrating with each word. He flicked a hand at her. Shut up, bitch! One of these days she was going to escape. One of these days she was going to find a real man who knew how to treat her the way she deserved to be treated. It was just a matter of time. But it was a time that would come. She would make sure of that. If she believed in a god, she would pray that the day would come tomorrow. Today. But there was no god. Any god wouldn't let her fall like this. Plus, waiting was difficult. Impossible. From the floors to the ceilings, the apartment they shared with three other people was decaying. The peeling paint neglected holes that dotted the walls. Their home was a silent expose on the effectiveness of violence and subjugation. She was pretty sure the cockroaches had become immune to the mold problem. Numb to it. The same way she was numb to life. It hadn't always been like this. Once upon a time, 
She was the model of a woman with a plan. She had her shit together. Driven and young, Chelsea once possessed a dangerous mix of intelligence and beauty that smart women leveraged to make millions on the backs of the misogynistic culture. But every chance she ever had, every gift she was given, she'd wasted on narcotics-filled needles and nose candy that provided an escape from the strife of living. People didn't understand. They didn't appreciate how miserable it was to see the world through her eyes, to feel its decay on her skin. They looked at her and pitied her, not caring to understand the pressures which ultimately compressed her into the ruined mess of constantly disheveled hair and crackled makeup, her perpetual mask of emotional desolation. But her recovery, the promise of feeling alive again, was close. She only had to melt the snowman. I'm hungry. He rolled over onto his stomach, his hairy, pimpled ass exposed to the daylight for the first, but not the last time today. Go make me something. I don't feel like it. And I don't feel like being hungry. He snapped his finger. Once. Now go make me something, Chelsea. She moaned, hating him. But got up and crossed the twenty feet of linoleum to the kitchen. The snowman always got what the snowman wanted. A few cheap beer bottles lay toppled over at the back of the bottom shelf. The empty milk container mocked her. At least she had three eggs in the carton. That wouldn't feed both of them. Looks like I'm eating out. She groaned as her stomach protested its delayed fulfillment. Or her stomach was smart enough to realize there might not be enough money in the account to pay for a fast food breakfast. Fuck. What if he says we're broke? When aren't we? She mumbled to the uninhabited refrigerator. The snowman grumbled, still face down on the couch. What? She shook her head. Nothing. She grabbed a pan from the cupboard and threw it on the stovetop. It clanked on the iron grates and the snowman grumbled his displeasure. He hated noise. Chelsea did her best to ignore him. There was a time when she would have cried any time he got upset. Now, she was too dead inside to care. When will his heart explode? She wondered. Could putting thought to it make the dream come true? But snowmen didn't have hearts. Years of liquor, coke, cigarettes, barbiturates, and cheap beer eroded anything that might have passed as a heart, replacing it with an impenetrable core, untouched by corrosion. Chelsea realized she was daydreaming. Too late, registering the sizzling pan. Shit, the eggs. Chelsea turned them over. Burned. He's gonna fucking kill me. How is she going to tell him? Infernos were calmer than a hungry snowman. But if she was honest, maybe he'd finally give her the money to buy groceries. It wasn't something he usually did, even when times were good. Chelsea didn't even know where he stashed all the cash he made from pushing coke on business owners and politicians downtown. But if he knew they had nothing to eat, odds were good he'd be looser with the cash. Maybe he'd even part with a little extra and would forget about it long before he was sober again. Enough cash so she could buy herself a second pair of jeans, maybe. The thought excited her. She scraped the eggs into the garbage and didn't even bother to wash the pan. She'd scrape out the burned parts later. The iron was hot. She needed to act while he was still coked out of his mind, or the moment would pass, and he might do something worse than not give her enough money to feed herself. The last time she pissed him off, it took her over a week to walk without a limp. A week of staying inside so people didn't guess at what he'd done. She couldn't be cooped up with him again for that long. Chelsea glanced at the snowman, sprawled open on the couch, and in that split second, felt something she rarely ever felt. Hope. Rushing across the bedroom, she changed into her only pair of jeans and a sweater, grabbing her jacket on the way back to the living room. The world outside faded into white as snow fell. 
The shopping trip was going to be cold as the snowman's love. She didn't care. A shopping trip meant a few minutes of feeling alive again. He was still asleep. Chelsea shoved his shoulder once. Two times would get her a fist to the gut. Hey, wake up. Her tone was moderate, appropriate, or that punch would surely come. What? The snowman spit into the pillow. I need cash. Fuck off. Come on, Eddie. She slapped her thigh. She wanted him to see that she was upset. She wanted him to see that she was alive. Just give me... Chelsea didn't finish the sentence. The snowman vaulted to his feet. Before she realized he was standing, his fist was flying toward her head. A thick thud made the world swoon, and then she was falling over the torn arm of the recliner. Her back hit the chair arm, the part where the cloth cover was worn away years before and most of the stuffing ripped out by the husky they used to have. The husky that Eddie took off the leash when he was supposed to be walking it. The husky Eddie allowed to run into a neighborhood where rich people in Olympia lived. The sort of people who saw dogs like that and kept them and put chips in their necks and took them for monthly grooming. Probably even some doggy daycare shit, too. She never saw the dog again. Chelsea loved that dog. A lot more than she loved Eddie. You stupid cunt! Spit foamed in the corner of the snowman's mouth. Don't you ever call me that again! Chelsea leaned up on an elbow, holding the side of her face that felt as if it was on fire. What? Eddie? That's your name, isn't it? It felt good to poke him from the safety of the other side of the chair. Don't do it, bitch! He snarled. I'm the motherfucking snowman. I know. She finished for him. In a million years, Chelsea hadn't imagined she would provoke him like this. But goddamn, this felt good. Really good. The snowman waggled back and forth like a toddler who was about to piss his big boy undies. His usually narrowed gaze was wide with irritation and disbelief. Who was the last person to stand up to him? Chelsea wasn't sure anyone besides Eddie's junkies ever dared to speak to him like she was now. Are you fucking joking? Eddie lunged over the chair to grab her. Chelsea scurried backward, out of reach, into the kitchen. It was a bad decision. The kitchen was an open area, except for the four-chair table placed dead center in the small room. Still not on her feet, it was simple for Eddie to get to her. Enraged, he quickly closed the space between them. You fucking cunt, I'm gonna fucking kill you! Then Chelsea did something that pushed him over the edge. Threw him into a dizzy rage, unlike any she'd seen, and wasn't even sure he was capable of. She laughed. It was easy. They were fighting, and Eddie was pissed. Again. And this time over the all-important issue of ruined eggs and her calling him by his actual name. It was ridiculous as it was jaded. No other couples acted like this, not even the coke addicts that came around from time to time trying to score a free flight from Eddie. But not her and Eddie. This was them. This was how they were. Chaotic fragility. Are you fucking laughing at me? Eddie knocked over one of the chairs. Chelsea's lips trembled all on their own. He closed the distance. Chelsea backed up. Eddie raised a fist. Chelsea flinched and cowered against the counter cupboards. I ought to kill you, he threatened. He was close. His stale breath fell on her in a thin film. You know that bitch? I ought to kill you. Then Eddie grabbed her by the throat, and Chelsea knew he would do it. He squeezed. She gasped. Chelsea didn't want to show him that she was afraid. He'd threatened to kill her a thousand times if he'd done it once. Before her fall, she never imagined a world where she'd be okay with being threatened by anyone. Times changed when life stripped you of options and dignity, she guessed. Here she was now, serving as a warning to those who made poor life choices. She never thought she'd die because of them. Eddie's grip wasn't relaxing. Her throat felt thick, like those times when she'd partied too hard and urgently needed to evacuate a stomach full of booze and pills. Chelsea opened her mouth to draw a breath she desperately wanted, 
but nothing came. Eddie pulled, and she scrambled to her feet before he ripped her head from her shoulders. They were face to face now. Chelsea grasped for anything that would ground her to the world. The countertop was cool, wet. Her hand slipped, stabbing the basin of the sink, sending jolts of pain up her elbow. She couldn't even cry out. Eddie's face closed in on hers. I'll fucking kill you. In that moment, his eyes burned with the desire for blood. There was no question about that. He was going to choke her until she was gone and he was free. He'd crush her windpipe like he enjoyed crushing cheap beer cans he'd spent nights emptying when they were too broke to snort some of their extra inventory. Chelsea knew she was seconds away from blinking out of the world in the middle of a shitty apartment in snowy Olympia, Washington. Memories of her life in Los Angeles back when she was flying flickered across the big screen of her mind. She'd almost been someone. Now she was about to become a faceless statistic, another number in a domestic violence report sitting on some enervated cop's desk. Chelsea's hand, still in the sink, bumped the handle of the pan she'd burned the eggs in. The black iron wrapped itself inside her fingers. The handle was sturdy, so unlike anything else in her life. And she brought it up in a quick, shallow arc. The side of the pan connected with Eddie's face. She hit him just as he'd hit her. A satisfying clunk filled the small kitchen, and Eddie collapsed in a heap against the table. It toppled and skidded away. He's going to kill me. Chelsea reminded herself, looking down at the man who always followed through on the promises that benefited him while ignoring any that didn't. Hundreds of nights of sobbing herself to sleep served as her evidence that he gladly failed her over and over. And in that second of reflection, she knew everything she needed to know to make this life-altering decision. If she didn't kill him, he would finish his work when he regained consciousness. Chelsea jumped on Eddie's chest, raised the pan, and brought it down on his head. The first strike was the most difficult, but she'd swung it out of instinct to survive. The second swing was much easier. This was a strike filled with rage and revenge, the toll she'd paid for his self-loathing and addiction. Nothing more than any animal would want for itself. She needed to respect herself enough to realize that. And it was easier with each subsequent thunk against his head. Under the assault, Eddie didn't move, didn't cry out. Each swing delivered freedom. She felt lighter, knowing that the only thing separating her from finding the person she used to be was dying here on the kitchen floor. When he was gone, she would find his hidden case of drug money. It wasn't a fortune, but it was enough to get her away from this decrepit life and buy her time to figure out what she was going to do next. Snow piled on the small balcony, a full-blown storm now. By the time Eddie's mashed face stopped thunking against the pan, Chelsea knew she had to act fast. She had to find the money and escape. This city would start shutting down if it wasn't already, and their roommates would be home as soon as the city bus could bring them back. Eddie was dead. No amount of egg pans to the face was going to help her escape. So Chelsea spent the next few hours tearing apart the apartment. Under a set of loose floorboards by the television cabinet, she found what she was looking for. Two olive green military bags stuffed to the top with cash were jammed into the narrow space. Ones, fives, and tens. Thousands of dollars. A new life. Chelsea snagged the bags and loaded the new BMW Eddie never let her drive. He bought it six months ago, and she'd never even sat in the driver's seat. It was his baby. He told her whenever she had the guts, as he said, to ask permission to drive it. Now she was taking it. He couldn't protest, and this would convince the cops of a robbery if the money in the car were gone. This was exciting, to spit in the face of the man who'd ruined her, even if he was already dead. 
Chelsea loaded the money and her single bag of clothes, leaving everything else she owned behind. There was one last thing to do. Dispose of Eddie the Snowman. The snow was falling fast, which worked to her advantage. People hid from it, remaining inside, making it easier to get his body to the car. The most difficult part was dragging him to the elevator, thankfully it worked today, and out to the car. By the time she'd loaded him into the trunk and slunk in the driver's seat, her sweaty hair matted to her face. Her chest heaved, filling and emptying in gradually decreasing breaths. Chelsea's heart rate slowed enough to convince her it was excitement and not death she was feeling. Finally composed, she pulled away from her personal hell. She didn't stop until she was east of Tacoma. Out here, the cities curved away toward Canada. Out here, people spread as far and wide as the Cascade Range took them. Out here, up in the hills, she could get rid of Eddie. In her previous life, she skied. A lot. During college, Chelsea spent weekends chasing thrills on the money her parents sent her every few weeks. That was when she was an athlete, young and healthy, with an ass that drew more gawking than the last ten years combined had. She was at home in the mountains, like she'd never left. But she wasn't here to ski. She drove these winding back roads to find a place remote enough to dump Eddie. The snowstorm chased her all the way out of Olympia and continued its eastward path, she needed to be back to sea level before it hit the mountains or she'd be stuck. The BMW was shit in the snow, a lesson she learned as soon as she raced away from the apartment and almost sideswiped a local who was trying to cross the street and get inside to get warm. A trailhead stretched toward the road, emptying into a small area where hikers and hunters parked their vehicles before heading into the mountains. No cars dotted the parking area. Chelsea didn't want to test her luck. It was dusk and getting darker with each passing second. She needed to be out of the woods before darkness descended. A parked car would raise suspicions. A parked car here when night fell would draw someone from law enforcement. The sight of Eddie's broken body assaulted her as soon as she opened the trunk. The drive was relatively short, less than two hours, but it provided her with an opportunity to mentally cleanse herself from what she'd done. Seeing him like this was an uneasy reminder of the cost of her freedom. Pulling Eddie's body from the trunk required two free hands. She took a deep gulp and got to work. Eddie's cologne drifted into her nasal passages, reminding her of the times he would lay on top of her and grunt himself to satisfaction while she was tripping. She wasn't going to miss him. His head bobbed against a raised arm as she yanked him, step by excruciating step, up the path. His particular shade of death became more prominent by the minute. Chelsea's stomach heaved. Eddie's demolished cheek and collapsed eye socket made her gagging worse. He deserved nothing less. Maybe he shouldn't have fed her volatile drugs, getting her hooked and secluding her from everything in her life that made her happy. If he'd let her live, maybe she would have let him. Eddie deserved every bit of this, and she deserved the spiritual and financial windfall that was coming her way. No remorse. No regret. Chelsea's feet slipped out and she landed hard on her ass, making her shout in pain. Glancing over her shoulder, she exhaled. The trail gained elevation quickly. There was no way she could get him up another 50 feet. Eddie's corpse was heavy and uncooperative, and she tired quickly after the adrenaline of killing him flushed from her system. Years of abusing her body weren't helping either. She couldn't do this anymore. This was going to have to be the spot. A steep drop-off beckoned. Chelsea couldn't see how far down it went in the fading light, but it was steep enough to meet her needs. She didn't have to pull him up the mountain when all she had to do was drop him over the side of it. 
inching him toward the edge. Chelsea's lungs burned. Her thighs quivered. The plan was to get to Seattle tonight and buy an expensive hotel room, the most expensive she could find that would take cash. But her incontinence would have to wait another night. Tonight, she'd have to find something close and start her elevated experience tomorrow. Falling to her knees next to Eddie's body, and with all the energy she had left, she shoved. Eddie's body rocked forward and then back toward her. Chelsea gave a cry of frustration that sounded odd against the silent mountains. He wasn't going to deny her this. He wasn't going to get his way this time. In that brief second, she screamed with all the pent-up rage and pain of wasted years, slamming into him with every bit of force 140 pounds could muster. When Eddie the Snowman rolled over the edge, Chelsea cried. His body tumbled, slowly at first, and then picked up speed as it descended. She watched his corpse tumble down the slope. Even bouncing off trees didn't stop the momentum created by the pitch of the mountain. Chelsea remained on her knees, at the edge of the trail, gasping for breath. She didn't need the dying daylight to ensure Eddie was gone for good. She could hear him falling. Branches cracked, twigs snapped, thumping as his corpse bounced off hard snow-covered mounds. Down and down Eddie tumbled until she no longer heard him over the cleansing wind. Only then did she stand and begin living again. Eddie was gone from her life. Mommy, can I have one? Chelsea laughed. No, sweetie. You've already had three. Jacob was a ravenous boy. The fact that her mother kept feeding him brownies wasn't one of her better ideas. Chelsea didn't blame her. They'd missed so many years of life over the fallout that was so distant now as to be a dream. This was them enjoying being a family again, so unlike that time before. It was another lifetime. I was a different person. Years removed from that drug-induced hell she'd survived with Eddie, her life was hers again. The money helped, a lot. It paid for a small home in Shelton, where real estate was cheaper. It paid for a drug treatment program she completed on her first attempt. It paid for some of her education, but not all. Tuition was ridiculous. And it all paid off. She was clean for years now, educated, and married to Jared. And she was a mother now, a mother, to precious Jacob. Success after success came for them. It was fairy tale the past decade. They opened a cabin resort outside of Mount Rainier's National Park, to which she was about to return. She was the different woman she always wanted to be. You be good to Grandma, Chelsea smiled, kneeling to get to Jacob's level. I will, Mommy. Her mother patted Chelsea's hand, loosening its grip on Jacob. Go before it gets dark. Chelsea stood and hugged her. Are you sure you're okay with this, keeping Jacob for this long? Cynthia laughed. Oh, please, a week is nothing. Plus, she wagged a finger at Chelsea. You and Jared deserve the cruise. You've been working too much. It's time for you to relax for a bit. Enjoy it. They shared a final hug before Chelsea kissed Jacob one more time. Waving goodbye to the two outlines of people, one large, one tiny, standing in her mother's door, squeezed her heart. The disappearing house encouraged her onward, even as the evening began to shroud it. The drive was short, but the night was quickly blackening, and it was snowing again, as it had been for weeks. Starting in late October and two months later, the snow still hadn't abated. Every year since moving to the mountains, they'd had a white Christmas. This one would be no different. And she loved every minute of it. 
so different than the dreary Christmases in Olympia. Chelsea was excited. It took more than money to operate the business. In fact, money was the thing that launched the business. It didn't maintain it. Almost overnight, she had to become a receptionist, booking clerk, groundskeeper, and plumber. Those were the real skills that kept the cabins booked and patrons returning season after season. And working for two years straight without a day off had worn her down. The business was fulfilling but exhausting, and this cruise was long overdue. The thought of an all-inclusive drink menu, days filled with poolside lounging with a good book, and oceanside port stops at exotic locations helped get her out of her mother's front door. It was the only way she could be okay with leaving Jacob behind. Chelsea hadn't been separated from him for more than a single night when he had a sleepover at a friend's house. A week? She wasn't sure she could survive that. At that moment, the world went white. Chelsea slammed on the brakes. She'd been daydreaming, half paying attention to the road she could navigate in her sleep. The sharp bend was a few hundred yards in the distance one second, and the next, her windshield was a blanket of white. A mountain slide, she thought, her throat gripped closed with fear. The car kicked sideways. Chelsea corrected, away from the side of the road that dropped down the mountain. The back wheels caught and whipped the car in a 180-degree turn. Her head slammed against the window. Stars exploded to life in her vision. She hit something, and the car spun, rotated in a dizzying circle, too quickly to remain oriented. Then the world gave way, and she fell. The car went over the edge. Without a barricade, there was nothing to stop her from tumbling down the mountainside. The car struck a tree and flipped. Glass exploded. Chelsea screamed at the assault of shards, wind, and snow that filled the car. A tree branch snapped into the cabin, catching her square in the face. She lost all but the slimmest of senses that she was still falling. For an eternity of seconds, the car bounced through young trees, bouncing and spinning off the larger ones, gaining momentum as it fell. She was going to die out here. The snow-covered landscape became the sky. The blackness became the ground above which she floated, turning over and over, tumbling further from the road. And then it all ended. The car came to a rest on its roof. Chelsea was alive, but in too much pain to think through what she needed to do. Her face felt hot. There was a pool of blood forming on the roof of the car underneath her. Everything and nothing hurt. And the night was silent. At some point during the accident, the engine stopped running. The bitter smell of gas filled the cooling night air. It was quiet. The headlights that revealed millions of glittering specks of snow dust, the only sign she was alive. Chelsea knew she was in trouble, serious trouble. This part of the road wasn't a main thoroughfare for the skiers and snowboarders. There was no reason for anyone to come this way at this time of year except to get to the various cabin resorts. And at this time of night in the middle of the week, those types of visitors would be few and far between. Only a great stroke of luck was going to bring a motorist in this direction. To make matters worse, she had no safety gear in the car. The trip to her mother's was supposed to be quick, so she hadn't bothered to grab blankets. At best, and only if she could get to the trunk, the flares might still be there. She could use those to light her way back up the mountain and alert someone. Assuming I can walk. The pull of gravity placed her weight on the seatbelt. The tension eliminated any slack she might have used to unhook it. Panic rose at the realization that she might be trapped in her own car, upside down, in a tight valley at the foot of a mountainside road. Passing motorists might not even be able to see this far down. Tears began to stream down, up her forehead. Jacob, 
Jared. God, no. She fought the seatbelt buckle, but it refused to come loose. Help! Her cry disappeared beyond the illuminated part of the forest. No one answered. No one should. The nearest house was a few miles away at best. But she cried out again anyways. Throughout her life, she'd been a fighter, and that wasn't about to change now. She was in a desperate situation, but she wasn't going to sit here and wait for the Reaper. She would do what she always did, even when things seemed hopeless. Help! Her message carried through the night. Silence. Despair grew to an overwhelming force. A blackout was coming. That might be the best way to go, to fall asleep and never wake up. Painless. She wouldn't suffer the anguish of freezing to death, watching the world become grayer until her will to live was sucked from her. Sleep, even eternal, would be better than that. Her eyes closed, heavy. Chelsea hoped her final sleep would be filled with visions of Jacob and Jared. They rescued her belief in humankind after years of hell and torture. They saved her. Would they miss her as much as she already missed them? They would, right? They were a loving family, small but close, working past the scars of the past together. Surely they would re- A branch snapped. Chelsea's eyes rocketed open, and she stared into the white waste of the falling night. Again, another crack and... and something else. Scratching. Was it a bear? Shit, shit, shit. My gun, where did I put the gun? The glove box? Can I reach? More scratching. This time closer. Just out of range of the lights. But that wasn't scratching. It was too persistent. Too rhythmic. Not scratching. Shuffling. In the beams of the headlights, something moved. The deep darkness was thick but not impenetrable, a hint of something out there. The gun might or might not be in the glove box, but she wasn't going to wait. She reached, stretched, strained against the hold the seatbelt had on her. Her shaking hand stretched as she willed her joints to give just a little more. But the glove box was too far away, forever out of reach as long as she was restrained. The thing in the blackness shuffled closer. In a desperate last move, Chelsea yanked her car keys out of the ignition. Finding the thickest one, she began sawing at the belt. She wasn't sure it would work, but what other options did she have? The shuffling now came from the edge of the world, where her headlights met the eternal blackness. Chelsea risked a glance into the beams of light, not sure she wanted to see what was coming. Her hand went numb at the sight the keys falling onto the roof of the car. Out of the woods walked a man. A man who wasn't a man. A man whose naked legs were as white as the snow that blanketed the ground in her car beams. No, they were whiter. As if the cold that destroyed his legs was deeper, older than the snow on the ground. Ageless. A man whose bare feet torturously crunched the ground in a festering creep. A man who strode through the world as naked as the day he was born, his frozen white cock swaying back and forth, as flaccid and loose as if blood still surged through it. A man whose flabby stomach betrayed the fact that even in death, neglect still had consequences. A man whose half-face had frozen in the perpetual state of the moment of his death, the moment he was assaulted by a frying pan containing burned eggs, the fact that he was beaten and battered after he fell into a sleep from which he never woke again. As the frozen half-face smiled, the eyeball hanging from the crushed socket wiggled, laughed all on its own. Eddie. Chelsea screamed, yanking at the seatbelt, tugging at it, commanding it to separate. She slithered, pushing up against the roof. Rip! Tear! 
yet it didn't give. It refused her that which she lusted for. Escape. And inch by inch, the frozen corpse of her former lover moved toward the vehicle, crunching snow, step by lethargic step. Mere feet away, he lowered himself to clear the hood of the car and crawled toward her with a deprived, lopsided grin on his face. She'd seen that smile a million times. It was the smile Eddie only showed when he'd screwed someone out of a deal or scored a big hit. It was the smile he wore on those nights when he beat her. The corpse drew closer, its white arms extended outward, his sky-blue nails promising to dig into her, deep. Hello, bitch. Frozen death had robbed Eddie of his voice, leaving only a wispy emanation to it. His claws made the first contact with her skin. The ice-blue nails closed around her throat. Eddie? She choked. The corpse shook its head, the loose eyeball swaying side to side. No, cunt, it answered. I'm the motherfucking snowman. And then the nails dug into her skin, beneath her skin, into her esophagus, into her and the world went white the end I want to thank Heather Auden for doing such a wonderful job narrating that story Yin vs. Yang, Kenichi Om, Miyu, and Haunted Corpses for allowing me to use the creepy music you heard underneath that narration. Again, that was called The Snowman. It's one of the 12 stories that are included in my upcoming horror anthology titled 12 Deaths of Christmas. It will be available for pre-order this fall and will be released after Thanksgiving at the end of November. Twelve Wicked Tales of Holiday Horror. To find out how you can get a special pre-order price, make sure you sign up for the newsletter at paulsading.com. Join the author Paul Sading page on Facebook or become a patron, and I'll always share the news there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support of this show, and please tell your friends to pick up a copy of 12 Deaths of Christmas. I'd really appreciate the help getting a strong launch with this second book.